everybody Jesus He's loving on me He's loving on you And everybody Yeah I'm so glad He loves me I'm so glad He cares I'm so glad He loves me I'm so glad He's there Jesus serve today. Worship team, if you guys want to come on up. And uh, we have some ushers that will be helping us in the back. We also have kids in the sound booth, so you're in for a real treat this morning. If you guys want to stand with us, we're going to open up with one song called Our God.
to do our announcements for us. Olivia, where you at, girl? What? 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 Oh, here she is. Great. Hi, my name. Wait, welcome to Kids Sunday. My name is Olivia. One thing I like about this church is seeing the fruits of the Spirit. And if, if you are new today, please see Miss Anne at the back for a welcome time gift. Let's do some singing. Very good. Thank you, Olivia. Now, I did have one person that asked if they could make an impromptu announcement. And since I really like this person, I said yes. So, Mom, come on up. We just wanted to make sure that you knew about the ladies' brunch and the men. We have great missionaries coming next week. Esther and Andrew Schaefer, and uh, we've met them. They're amazing. The ladies are having a brunch at 10 o'clock on Saturday, and we are having quiche, fresh fruit, homemade cinnamon rolls, baked um, uh, French toast. Um, you're going to eat well. And all you have to do is show up. You don't have to bring anything, ladies. So 10 o'clock next Saturday, you'll love meeting Esther. Um, I know I told you 30 seconds, but one of the things I remember with Esther is that we, when we were in Africa, uh, Lindsay was teaching the kids to do, play Duck, Duck, Goose, except there isn't a goose name in, in their language, so we were doing Duck, Duck, Cow. And the kids got laughing, and they were laughing and laughing, and I turned around and looked at Esther, who's coming next week, and she had tears running down her face because there were all these villagers coming in, and I said, why are, why are, what are they all coming in for? And she said, they've never seen their children laugh before and they're coming to see them. This is the missionary you want to hear. And then Paul Holman has opened up his home uh, to the guys. You don't have to have a gun, but if you have one, take it with you. And they're going to be shooting, and they're going to talk to Andrew. So um, it's going to be a great Saturday, and then Andrew's going to speak to us um, at both services. But you will be so sad if you missed Andrew and Esther. Sorry.
Team, you guys may have a seat. Thank you. Good job, worship team. We can have our ushers come forward, please. Thank you, worship. Um, and during the offertory today, we're going to be hearing from Luke Sharon. He's going to be playing the piano for us. We'll have Michael play. Dear God, thank you for this good day. And we'll have a fun time and we'll learn lots about you and your church. And we'll hope this offering will please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, thank you, kids. That was tremendous. Wow. I'd like to give you all a big hug, so I'll just like, oh, I love you all, okay? Luke, great job on the piano. That was a surprise, Faith of Our Fathers. That was beautiful. All right, Lindsay says it's my turn. It is my turn now. All right, amen. Okay, kids, you want to go to junior church? Thanks again. You can go. Praise the Lord. You know, I love the, the songs that they were singing. I mean... Uh, it's interesting that whether it's the little children singing it or the adults singing the songs at East Lake Road Alliance Church, we're singing about the same Savior, the fact that Jesus is real, that He is alive, that He loves us, and He wants to be in a relationship with us. Doesn't get any better than that. Amen. Yeah, it was wonderful. And we thank Lindsay, our children's director, for all the work she puts into leading our children every week in uh, the truths of God. Well, we want to uh, say Happy Father's Day to you dads today. We're going to talk today about God's plan for a family man or God's design of, of a family man. And we're going to be uh, looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 4 in just a minute. Again, happy Father's Day. We want to say thank you to your dads who are doing it God's way. I should say thank you to your dads who are trying to do it God's way. We know that's an effort and it's an ongoing effort, ongoing development. We want to thank you for doing it. We want to encourage you to keep on keeping on. Keep on doing what you're doing. Keep on figuring out God's plan for your, wife, uh, for your life and for your wife and for your family. And, and, and keep doing it. If you're here today as a father and not quite sure of what God's plan for your role is, well, we'll just have a look together today at God's Word 
uh, and we'll trust that we'll learn how to do it God's way together. Again, it's not something we ever entirely figure out, but it certainly is a goal that we should have for each other. For every one of us here this morning, I think we could all say that at least in a broad sense, in a, in a very general sense, we'd like to improve how we do family. I hope that's what you would like to see happen in your own life. Improve the way we do family and improve the way we do in general human relationships, all of our human relationships. So I want to challenge you right at the start of the sermon today to think of these spiritual challenges that we're going to be reviewing as uh, a, an undertaking uh, like a home improvement project around your house. Now we're not going to be asking you to put down new floors or to put down new paint on the walls or those kind of things, but we're going to be challenging you to undertake one of the most difficult of home improvement projects. I'm going to be asking you to work to bring your home in line with what God's Word says about it and what God's will is for it. As we study the Scriptures, we find that God puts the primary responsibility for having a godly, biblical family squarely on the man. Now, I believe that is why men, husbands, fathers in our culture especially, it seems like, have been under severe attack. We don't have to look very far to see this. Very often in the media even, the husband and the father is portrayed as a, a bumbler, a fumbler, and a lot of times simply as a, a real idiot. Certainly we're, we're aware that men are going through all kinds of pressures, indeed in our society today. today. Men have tremendous job pressures. You know, I, I think of myself as a young person just starting out and building a family and, and how it was doable, it seemed like, in those days financially to get it done. But today, with the cost of everything the way it is and the pressures financially on men and families, I, I feel for young people just starting out trying to get a, a, a foothold financially in the world. Tremendous job pressures. Men face tremendous temptations from society today. You know, everywhere we look today, men are faced with the temptation, and not only men, but women too, uh, of pornography. You know, if you, you pick up the paper today, even to pick up the Sunday paper today, and you look at the, the ads for the major retailers, what we see there is, would have been considered just a few years ago soft pornography, and we're using it to sell, sell goods today. Men are tempted with pornography, and I would encourage you guys, if you're tempted that way, or if you're involved in it, you need to be praying about it. You need to come along some, uh, some man who will hold you accountable and get out of that. It's a sin. And it's lost its stigma as sin. Pornography lost its stigma as sin. Alcohol, use and abuse has lost its stigma as sin. All these things put pressure on men today. And it's, it's very difficult for men today to stay pure in this world. We realized several years ago the feminist movement put pressure on men. Uh, Dr. Paige Patterson, he was the... Uh, uh, the president of the Baptist Theological School said that one of the greatest problems in American life today is the feminization of men. There's an effort by some to try to make men like women. Well, actually, there's a, a, a movement today to try to make men into women. And as, as we, we see it all over the news today. You know, it's happening all around us, and it's, it's uh, not the way God designed it. The feminine, feminist movement several years ago tried to sell America on the idea that there was no difference between men and women. But the stubborn facts of biology simply refused to go away. Time magazine several years ago, they had a featured article on the difference between men and women. It discussed why men and women are different. And the result of the article, after all that study and all those words, was this, simply this, that they were born that way. Wow, what a revelation. What a revelation. Men and women, they found out, were just different, you know. Their brains are wired differently. There are some differences, you know, in men and women. And, and whenever I think about that, you know, I like to do my research. And I came up with some things, differences between men and women. I've shared them with you, some of them in the past, but, but uh, some of them are new. And bear with me as I give you these. Now, these are not, you know, these are not the pastor's ideas. Uh, so, so don't kick me at, at the back of the church at the end of the sermon. But these are things I found, okay. 
There's a big difference, I understand, in, in the way men and women uh, handle things when they eat out. This article said when the bill arrives, John, Brad, Tony, and Daniel will each throw in $20, even though the total was only $34.25. None of them will have anything smaller than the 20 and none will admit they want the change back. However, when Mary, Susan, and Claire, and Barbara get their bill, out come the pocket calculators. Big difference. There's difference in the way they think about the future. I understand a woman worries about the future until she gets a husband. And then a man never worries about the future until he gets a wife. <laughs> There's a difference in the way they think about marriage. A woman marries a man expecting he will change, but he doesn't. A man marries a woman expecting that she won't change, and she does. <laughs> this is interesting, and, and I know this to be true personally. See, my wife's in the nursery. I got, <laughs> I got a break, amen. There's a big difference, you know, in the organization of men's and women's bathrooms. I understand that a man has maybe five items in his bathroom. He has a toothbrush, a razor, shaving cream, a bar of soap, and a towel from Motel 6. <laughs> As opposed to a woman, I know this is true, the average number of items in a woman's bathroom is 328. <laughs> and the average man cannot identify most of them. There's a difference in the way they argue. Women always have the last word in an argument. Anything a man adds after that is the beginning of a new argument. <laughs> and then this one, I love this one, and I know you've heard this before. This is about nature, you know. Men wake up looking as good as when they went to bed. Women will somehow deteriorate during the night. <laughs> Go figure, right? But we try, right, guys? We do try. I mean, it's the best thing we can do is we try. And, and I've got this one account I want to share with you of this guy who really tried. His name was George. He was a thoughtful husband. He wanted to give his wife something special for his birthday, which was coming up soon. And as he sat on the edge of the bed, he watched his wife turning back and forth and looking at herself in the mirror. Rita, he said, what would you like for your birthday? The guy was trying, right? His wife continued to look at herself and said, I'd like to be six again. So George, he knew just what to do. On the big day, he got up early and he made his wife a bowl of Fruit Loops. Then he took her to the amusement park where he, they rode all the rides. Uh, and he gave her all the junk food. Rita's stomach fell upside down and her head was reeling. Nevertheless, George took her to McDonald's after the amusement park, bought her a Happy Meal with extra fries and a chocolate shake. Next, it was a movie with popcorn soda and her favorite candy. And as Rita wobbled into the house that evening and flopped on the bed, George asked her, Well, dear, how did it feel to be six again? And she said, Oh, George, I meant my dress size. <laughs> but we try. And it's all we can do is we try. What I want to talk to you about today seriously is the role of a man in the family. God's plan for a family man. And a lot of guys in American culture have never been taught this. As we move as a culture further and further away from the truth of, God's uh, truth of God's Word, many men are not even hearing these kinds of things. That's why we have the ministries that we have. That's why we have the men's ministry that we have. That's why we have the outreach programs that we have for our men, the Bible studies and the, the, the fellowship times together, to get men side by side who can learn together the truths of God's Word and how we should be living our lives as role models for our families. We need godly men who can help other men become the men they ought to be for the glory of God. Now, I don't want to say anything that will make anybody here uh, really feel bad today uh, because of the way families have been attacked in our culture today. Many are broken. Many simply aren't working right. Many are not organized the way God designed them to be. But the ideal, i got to say this right at the start, the ideal for the family is that there be a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. That is God's ideal. That is His original and it is on, His only approved plan for the family. Now we're going to use some scripture verses today that particularly are directed towards the husband and the wife relationship. But I believe we can extend what I'm going to say beyond the relationship uh, of the uh, 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 of that relationship between husband and wife to the entire relationship 
of a man in his family. We want to put the emphasis on the men today, but on the men in his family. But these also are, are, are for women. And even to the broader relationship, not only a, a man and a woman or a husband and a wife, but to all of humanity. Because what is said about the husband's responsibility here to the wife can also be said about his responsibilities to the family and beyond. So let's look at these verses and think about God's plan of a family man. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Precious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We thank you, Lord God, for the roles that you have assigned to men and women and children. We thank you for the family structure, Lord God. And we pray that as we look into this this morning, that you would hide this poor preacher once again behind the cross of Christ and the very Word of God, that you would speak to us by your Word in your Spirit's presence. We pray it all to your glory, Jesus, and with much thanksgiving. Amen. Okay, so what's the Bible tell us? about God's plan of a family man. What's that man supposed to look like? And how's he supposed to act? Well, three points I want to get to today, and I'm going to make it easy for you. They all start with an L. Loving, leading, and lifting. We see this in this passage of Scripture. The first thing is, love your family. You say you didn't have to come to church to know that. You know you're supposed to love your family. I'm sure, and I hope that you do love your family. What I want to talk to you about today is what is really involved in loving your family. There are some illustrations given to us in Ephesians 5, which tell a man how he is to love his family God's way. Now, three times in these verses, it tells a man to love his wife. Now, listen, we could spend all morning just on that. He tells him to love his wife in verse 25. He says, husband, love your wife. In verse 28, so you ought to love your wife as your own body. In verse 33, let every one of you love his wife even as he loves himself. Then he illustrates it in verse 25. He says, love your wives, husbands, even as Christ also loved the church. Men, love your family like Jesus loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? Well, I'm so glad you asked this morning. Because the love of Jesus for his church was a selfless love. It was a sacrificial love. Jesus loved the church. Jesus loved sinners. He loved you and me so much that he was willing to sacrifice his very life on the cross of Calvary. That's how much he loves us. And that's how much a man is supposed to love his wife. Now, let me tell you something, men. That is a challenge, and it's a serious challenge for us today. How in the world are we supposed to do that? Love our wives the way that Christ loved the church. That kind of selfless, selfless, sacrificial love is what the Bible is talking about. 
You know, it breaks my heart when I minister to people who are going through marital issues. And, and it's all about it, every single one of them really comes from focusing on self, whether it's on the man's side or the woman's side. And there's a real simple formula, real simple formula for getting over it if the people would just apply it. And that is to love Jesus Christ first. Man, love Jesus Christ first. Woman, love Jesus Christ first. And then love the spouse more than you love yourself, giving up self. That's selfless love. That's how Christ loved the church. That's how a husband is supposed to love his wife. It's a sacrificial love. It's not trying to buy the love of your family by buying them things. It's not bartering with them for your love. You do this and I'll love you. It's not a conditional love. I will love you if. It's a sacrificial love. You know, love is primarily a verb. Love is not something you just feel. It's something you do. It's a decision. You decide to love your wife. You decide to love your children. It's a conscious decision, a sacrificial love. We have to decide to love our spouse that way. Now, for some of us, it's easier than others. See, my wife's not here today, so I can, I can be perfectly honest with you. I'm easy to love, so she's got the easy end of the deal. <laughs> she has to decide to love me when I'm not lovable. And I'm sure it happens a lot more than I'd like to admit. We have to make a decision to love our wife. It's important. It's a conscious decision. A lot of guys have it wrong. A lot of guys think the idea of a real man in the family means you just have to be a dictator or a tyrant to be the leader of the family. But when you study the Bible, you find that God commends uh, men to love families like Jesus loved the church, sacrificing kind of love. Not only does the Bible say that a man is to love his family like Jesus loved the church, but it says that you are supposed to love as you love your own body. Now, men, we love our bodies. That's why we have men's fellowship, where we get together and eat meat. Mike says we're going to eat meat at our fellowship. You ladies are having quiche. We would never do that because <laughs> we love our bodies. But the Bible says that we are to love our wives like we love ourselves. We feed ourselves. We clothe ourselves. Let's start loving our wives like we love ourselves, sacrificially. Let's show that chivalry in our house is not dead. Some of you guys, maybe you ought to open the door for your wife today. No, maybe you shouldn't because she'd probably pass out dead. <laughs> maybe you ought to fill her gas tank up with gas once in a while or put the windshield washer fluid in her car for her. Do something, do something for her. Let her know how special she is to you. Sacrificial love. There's some illustration of it. There's uh, application. That's the illustration, I should say. There's application of how a man is to love his family. 1 Peter 3, 7. We have that, Joe? 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, now this is application. Be considerate as you live with your wife. Now listen, guys, when I'm preaching to you about this, I'm preaching to myself because I, I believe me, I have not arrived, okay? But we have a goal, right? Don't we have a goal to live up to what God's Word says to us as Christian men? So let's try. Be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as, heir of, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Look at this. This is how serious this is to God so that nothing will hinder, hinder your prayers. Think about that. God says that we should do this, and if we don't do it, we are breaking fellowship somehow with our prayer connection. I don't know about you, but I don't want anything to hinder my prayers. I got a lot of prayers. I got a lot of needs. I don't want anything to hinder them. So this is the application of it. It says there, it says there, you are to be considerate as you live with your wife. It means that we must have some comprehension on the part of the father. It means the husband and the father is to do his best to understand all the members of his family. Every member of your family is distinct. Every child is different. Every single person in the family requires observation and special care. I've seen this in our own children. I've seen it in my brother and myself. You know, my brother and myself, we both had distinctly, distinctively different ways to drive our parents crazy. I, you know, it's, it's, it's something how God gives you these children. They came from the same father and the same mother. And you get one kid and you think, wow, I got it all figured out. 
And then God gives you another kid, and it's like exactly the opposite. Just a mystery, right? But, but the Bible says that we are to be considerate of them, to, to learn each one individually, to find out what makes them tick, and to deal with them on an individual basis. Kids have the same upbringing. If you have a dozen children, you're going to have a dozen different personalities. Amazing thing. We used to have people tell us when, we got, uh, when, when Linda got pregnant with our second child, you know, we were really naive. And uh, people would tell us, hey, you got, you got it all figured out. You had one child, the next one's going to be easy. Not going to cost you any more money. You already got all the clothes. And you know what? The, boy, that's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> They're different. They cost more. And they're totally, completely different. It says there to, to uh, respect them in that passage from Peter. It means to offer them courtesy. Treat every member of your family with courtesy. Interesting, isn't it? As a father and a husband, you're to treat your family members with courtesy. It's an amazing thing that sometimes we bring guests into our home and they are treated with more courtesy, think about this, and more politeness Men, men, I'm talking to you men now specifically, but this applies to the women too, that these guests will come into our home. We treat them with more courtesy and politeness than we do the own members of our house. The Bible says treat them with courtesy. Be respectful. Be respectful of them. Respect. Then it says, heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. I love that because this implies this sense of grace in the family. It's one of the things that I'm continually thankful to God for, His grace. Aren't you pleased? Aren't you blessed? Doesn't it make your heart beat a little faster with the love of Jesus to know that He's gracious, gracious to us, slow to anger, patient with us? We're supposed to be that way with our family members. When we understand that God has put us together, and that we are to stand by one another, come what may, to comprehend the truth that every member of our family is vitally important and deserves to be loved, nurtured, cared for, and honored. Men, we are to love our families. We are to stand for them. You know the one thing that I love about the relationship that I'm in with my wife? And we're not perfect, neither one of us. We're far from perfect, believe me. But this one thing I know, that my wife has my back always, and that I've got her back. There is nothing that would separate me from standing up for her or her standing up for me. Nothing. You know what? Last uh, last week, we were coming home from uh, uh, Israel. We were coming home from Israel, and you know, I have a tendency to get cranky when I get tired. I know, again, these things are hard for you to believe, but we flew all night, and we're in New York, you know, New York, you know, and and, uh, we just went through the security you know, and I get bugged. Uh, little things bug me, like kids with guns telling me where I have to do to go through security and the hassle that you go through, you know, and open up your bags and all that stuff, you know. So we've been through all that. It was a long day. We're in New York, and we get, finally get to the, to the uh, security, and the little kid tells me and Linda, you go in this line. And there's a, a lot of other people coming, right? So we go in the line that just happened to be the shortest line. Normally, if you follow me in line, you're in the longest line. You're going to be waiting forever, right? A grocery store, anything like that, don't follow me. But we go through this short line, and there's a, a businessman there, and he sees my wife getting in front of him because he's in a longer line, and he had to say something to her. Now, the guy's probably two feet taller than me and a lot hit bigger than me, but I said something. I was probably rude. Let me just put it that way. I don't remember exactly what it but he was messing with my wife, and I will not stand for that. And she would have done the same thing, by the way, for me to defend me. So I defended her. Men, stand up for your wives. One of the the things that drives me crazy is when a man or a woman who is in a marriage relationship says something disparaging about their partner. What a shame. Love your families. And if you want to read more about love, I'd love to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Read that for yourself on your own. Talks about love. The apostle's talking there about if I have this or if I have that, if I have the whole world and all these gifts, but don't have love, I've gained nothing. Okay, love. So we got to move on. Then lead your family. You're the spiritual leader of your family, man. You're the one who sets the pace for your family. What is involved in a man being a leader of his family? Leadership, someone says, rides on three other ships. One of the ships is called lordship. 
Ephesians 5, 20 and 22, we read it. Those verses speak of the fact of the lordship of Jesus Christ. This passage has to do with the family. is written in the context of the lordship of Jesus Christ. Listen very carefully, men. You cannot exercise authority unless you are under authority. If a man is going to exercise authority in his family, he must understand the Bible or the biblical principle of the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I believe the man has the hardest of the roles in the family setting because it's the man's responsibility, listen now, to yield himself to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's why every man needs to know Christ as their personal Savior, not only for his own sake, but also for the sake of his family. That's why every man needs to be totally dedicated to Jesus Christ as Lord of his life. Men, you will not lead your family to the lordship of Jesus Christ unless you are under the lordship of Jesus Christ. You have to have Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. And let me tell you something, your spouse and your kids will see right through a false uh, life. In other words, walking and talking differently. We've got to have Him as the Lordship. Matter of fact, Jesus had much to say about leading kids astray. He said in one passage of Scripture, you'd be better off to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into a lake than to lead the children away from the Lord. Very serious stuff. We have a heavy responsibility. The second ship there is partnership. Uh, Ephesians 5.21 says, submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Family is a partnership between a husband and a wife. It's an amazing thing that some men can lead major corporations and yet they can't even run their own family. I've seen this over and over again in the business world where men are running multi-million dollar corporations but their families are a wreck because Jesus Christ is not Lord of their life. Partnership. You've got to have a partnership with your spouse and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Marriage, uh, obviously, the, the third ship is headship, Ephesians 5.23. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and Savior of the body. It doesn't say the man is head over the wife. It says that he is head of the wife. It's not a dictatorship. It's not that. A man is not a dictator. He's the head tater, but not a dictator. That means that the man is the source of protection and the source of provision for his family. Men We are expected by God to protect and to provide for our families. 1 Timothy 5.8. Paul said this as he wrote to Timothy. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith. Again, do you see the seriousness of these verses? And he is worse than what? An unbeliever. Better off. Better off not to believe than to say you believe and not provide and protect. You see what I'm saying, men? You're responsible for your children. You're responsible for where they go. You're responsible for what they do. You are responsible for the priorities in their lives. Their spiritual nurture and development of the children is your responsibility, men. It's up to you to get the family into church. It's up to you to get the kids into Sunday school. It's up to you to be the model. The man is the head of the family because he's the source of direction and decision for the family. Some men need to get a little steel in their backbone and just do the role the way God calls them to do it. So we have to love our families. We have to lead our families. If we're going to do it God's way, we have to lift our families as well. I want to read verses 25 through 27 one more time to you. This is so important. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself, radiant, without stain or wrinkle, holy and blameless. That's what we're supposed to do, lift. You see how Christ lifts the church? That's the way we are to lift our families, men. We're to help them grow in their gifts. We're to find out how God has gifted our family members and encourage them to develop those gifts and to help them be everything God wants them to be. We should want our children to be all that God wants them to become. It says to nurture them in training and instruction. Another passage of Scripture, guys, I would refer you to is Deuteronomy chapter 6 where it talks about one Lord, one love, and one lesson. 
It talks about impressing the Word of God, impressing it on our children. That is our role. You know, it's a good thing that our children uh, are taught about education and we help them get a good education. It's a good thing to help our children become financially secure. It's a good thing to leave them the resources to live on when we leave the world. But if those things are all we give them, then we have failed miserably as men. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world yet lose his soul? Men, we have got to find a way to get the Word of God into our children. The world is putting its Word in them, believe me. We need to find ways to introduce them into the Word of God, to show them Jesus being real. And when we talk to them, when we're out with them, when we're doing events with them, whatever it is, we need to get the Word of God into them. We've got to get Jesus into them. We've got to give them a spiritual heritage. We've got to give them godliness and teach them the things of God that are the most important things of all. That's why lordship of Christ in a life and a home is so critical. Because if He's not Lord there, He's not Lord anywhere. It's our job, men. Not an easy task, but it's our job. Being a father and a family man can be frustrating. I know it's full of unexpected hazards and dangers. There will be bad decisions. We get many things wrong along the way. The hard fact is that fatherhood and godly manhood can never really be mastered. We don't graduate from the school of godly manhood. But it is wonderful, and it is fulfilling when we do get it right. Oh, that's wonderful. If we become the kind of men and the kind of fathers and the kind of husbands God wants us to be, and if we will lift our family to be everything God wants them to be, one of these days we might just reap a reward. We might just get a letter from our son saying, Dad, I want you to know I tested you a lot. Dad, I want you to know I did some things you weren't happy with. I know I gave you all kinds of grief. But, Dad, I want you to know as I look back on it now, I want to thank you for how you raised me. One of these days you may get a phone call from that daughter saying, Dad, I just want you to know I thank you so much for being a real man in our family. Men, it all starts in the family. You see, if our faith doesn't work at home, it doesn't work anywhere else. The family is either like a sand dune or it's like a sculpture. A sand dune has no shape or design to it. It just comes about by whatever environmental forces play upon it. It has no real foundation. Tomorrow's wind will change the shape and the look of the sand dune. But a a sculpture that has design, that has intention, there's a goal, there's a purpose. Your family will either be a sand dude, men, swept and blown around by the winds of culture and circumstances, or your family will be a sculpture with design and purpose and goal. It all comes down to what kind of a man we decide to be. We need men today who are willing to stand up and say, no more. This is a line in the sand. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It comes down to what kind of a man you decide you're going to be. Now, the children are going to come, and they're going to close us with a closing song. And it's not a song of invitation by, by uh, what we would consider a song of invitation by any stretch, but some of you dads and some of you fathers, you need to get before the Lord today and ask Him to help you be the man you should be. You know, you know you've fallen down, but praise God, He can lift you up. Some of you have failed to lead your family like you should. You can fix that today. God is a God of the second, third, fourth, a thousand chances. Some of you wives need to come and pray for the man that God gave you. Maybe you haven't supported him like you should. Maybe you've hindered him from leading the family. Some kids ought to come and pray and ask God to be very real in their mom and dad's lives. we got some kids here who love the Lord deeply. Some families just need to come maybe and pray. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior and you'd like to do that today. I'm going to encourage you to come. We're going to ask those kids to come forward. And again, if God has spoken to your heart and you want to just even hang around after the song, you just hang around. There'll be people here to pray with you. Whatever the Lord has laid on your heart, you deal with it today. These kids...
need godly men in their lives. Men that can influence their wives and influence their families and influence this generation to take a stand against the lies of the world, the deceit of Satan, and live for God. Father, how we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we may not be able to turn this country around. We may not be able to do anything about this sin-sick society. But, Lord, according to your word, we can change our families by changing our lives. I pray, Lord God, for each and every person in this room that you would be very real to them. And because you are Lord of their life, that people might see hope love, 
light, and truth in them and be drawn to the cross of Jesus Christ. We ask you now to dismiss us in your grace and peace. Watch over and keep us. We love you, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen. Thank you. Dismissed.